All right. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon where you're joining us from. And welcome to the WebGL and WebGPU virtual meetup. My name is Damon, a co-organizer of the San Francisco and Silicon Valley WebGL meetups, and I'll be your moderator today for a great uh, series of presentations from members of our global WebGL community. So as always, we're going to get the uh, rundown of the latest and greatest from Mr. Ken Russell. We'll hear from uh, Jasper Moore. Andra, Philip, and Brendan. Um, now, before we get started, a quick shout out and thanks to Kronos for the support and work to make this happen. This meetup is being recorded. Any questions that you have in the Q&A, not the chat, and we will get to them at the end of um, the presentation. So, without any further ado, I welcome our first speaker, uh, fellow co of the Silicon Valley Web of XR Meetup, Web Working Group Chair, and all around our Google, Mr. Ken, uh, to share the WebGL update. So Ken, when you're ready, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks so much, Damon. Okay, hello everybody. Um, great to have you here today. Uh, let's give a few updates from the WebGL Working Group. So uh, we've got a packed agenda, so let's just dive right into it. Uh, I'd like to advertise as always, that Cronus's WebGL working group tries to find all the cool projects that are out there, uh, whether they're advertised on Twitter or wherever, and assembles them into lists of great content that are sent out every couple of weeks to the WebGL dev list. They're also archived on a blog. I'd like to encourage everybody here to please join the community, post your cool creations, uh, send them out and get people's feedback. It's a great way to improve your products. And um, so please, again, just get involved in the community and. Uh, Let's see what you've built. Now, um, what you've all been waiting for, updates about WebGL2 and Safari. So as you may have seen since the last WebGL meetup, WebGL2 is enabled by default in Safari 15. Applause, applause, thank you very much. Um, this has been a huge collaboration between Google and Apple for the past close to two years now. It's using the new metal backend uh, that we have to thank uh, Chuyen uh, Le for the original contribution. And there's a huge credit to Kyle Pittington and the team from Apple for the direct to metal translator that gets WebGL shaders into metal shading language more efficiently. So the latest code can be tested on both macOS and iOS. For macOS, you need to install the macOS 12 or Monterey betas. And on iOS, you need to install the iOS 15 betas. So please test your applications now while bugs are still being fixed for the release. Any bugs you see, file them on bugs.webkit.org under the WebGL component. Now, a couple of updates from the Chrome browser and Angle teams. Chrome is making an architectural switch to use the Angle library everywhere. This is an implementation of OpenGL ES that also contains WebGL validation. It centralizes where the WebGL checks are done. This enables the switch to using Vulkan or Metal under the hood, and it brings many other attendant benefits. Now, while we were switching over to Angle and macOS over the past couple of months, we ran into some showstopper problems in the OpenGL driver, including graphical corruption and flat out kernel panics. And I'm pleased to say that we've diagnosed and worked around this problem. Uh, and this was joint work with Chris Cameron and Jeff Lang of the Chrome team. You can read the whole story to date on uh, the linked CR bug. And these slides will be published, so you don't need to jot that down. We'll probably give a presentation on that bug workarounds in the future because we're pretty proud of having figured out how to stop crashing machines. Uh, now an update on Engel's metal backend. So there's an ongoing collaboration between Apple and the Engel team to bring the code that Apple wrote for WebKit, the direct to metal translator, uh, from that snapshot of Engel, which is fairly old, up into top of tree. And while we were doing this, we encountered another showstopper bug, kernel panics on Chrome's uh, Mac testing machines, our automated fleet. These were older MacBook Pros still running Mac OS 10.14.6. And thanks again to Chuyen for finding the root cause. You can read all about this on uh, that linked angle bug. Upstreaming is moving forward again, we're, we're pleased to say, and both teams are heavily invested in getting to a common code base. So you'll, you'll see uh, more uniform WebGL2 support across all browsers uh, and faster WebGL2 support in the future. Now, a couple of updates on WebGPU. Um, the spec and implementations are moving forward well. Everybody's moving full steam on the implementations. And now is a great time to try out WebGPU in the various browsers. 
Uh, it's behind a flag in every browser because the validation isn't quite there yet. So don't browse the open web with these flags turned on just yet, but please do develop content for it. Now, remember, this is the spec where compute shaders will be delivered to the web. The WebGL2 compute spec is unfortunately no longer being developed. WebGPU gives everyone a lot of great headroom on the performance and API uh, fronts. So you will be able to get amazing 3D apps on the web with it. And Jasper St. Pierre's presentation today is going to show you how to get started bringing your large existing WebGL application to WebGPU. So we've got a great group of presenters today. Uh, I think uh, everyone can introduce themselves better than I can. Uh, and we'll answer all of your question and answers either in the chat or uh, live at the end of the session. So uh, there is a Q&A uh, bubble in everybody's Zoom UI. Please use that to answer your questions that way we can track them and make sure that we've answered them all. And so with that, I'd like to hand off to Jasper, uh, who's gonna give an awesome presentation on bringing WebGL to WebGPU. Hello, my name is Jasper, and today I'll talk, be talking a little bit about how I ported a side project of mine from WebGL to WebGPU and everything that I learned along the way when trying to do so. So first off, I'm not going to cover any of the high level conceptual differences between WebGL and WebGPU, as Kaya already did a great job covering that at the last month's meetup. And you can go watch the recording there if you want to catch up. The slides for that talk also have quite a lot of extra hidden slides that were cut for time. So I do recommend reading through them if you wanna get a bigger overview of WebGL versus WebGPU and how the conceptual ideas differ between them. Instead, what I'm gonna be talking about is this. So in my spare time, I've been working on a website that showcases a lot of different levels from various video games and renders them right inside the browser. I've actually added a lot of different video games over the years, and quite a lot of them have very different art styles and can use very different rendering techniques and technologies. For instance, what you're looking at here, none of this is PBR or standard material models, none of it is like GLTF supported stuff. It's all custom shaders and custom effects designed to give a cartoony look. And you can even see some depth of field in the background there. That's a real time depth of field effect. Here's another game, or here's another shot from another game that I've implemented. And you can see it as quite a different art style, both in the materials and also in the lighting. Uh, and if you look closely, you can actually see some planar reflections along the water. And those reflections are actually rendered in real time. They're not pre-baked or anything. And one more game here. Uh, and this one has a very stylized bloom effect, which you can see around the windows a little bit. And there's also some stylized reflections in the water as well. So since all of these games support different uh, rendering techniques and rendering art styles, and they all have to use different approaches to render their graphics, when I was first starting to develop the technology for this website, I quickly realized that existing frameworks like 3JS and Babylon.js just weren't flexible enough for the kinds of effects I wanted to recreate, and they really couldn't hit the performance targets that I wanted to hit. So I actually decided quite early on to write all of these different game renderers in a custom low-level framework, which I had built directly on top of WebGL. At some point, it became pretty clear that there wasn't gonna be much of a future in WebGL as a specification, and that a lot of that effort was instead going into this new API known as WebGPU. So I spent a few weekends porting my custom framework to the WebGPU API, and at the end of that, I had actually ported enough of it that I was able to render some very simple scenes in it. It turns out that this code base was quite a good test bench for the WebGPU API as a whole. Since I had a lot of different games with different rendering features and technologies, a lot of the different pieces uh, got complete coverage of the corner cases of the spec. So here's one of the first scenes I got running under WebGPU. Um, and you could actually see, uh, it says WebGPU in the screenshot there. So let me first talk about a few of the, his the issues I hit when doing this port and a few of the solutions that I came up with. So first, here's a let's talk a little bit about uniforms. In Reb, Re excuse me, <laughs> a lot more stuttery today. Hopefully that gets cut out. So first, let's talk a little bit about uniforms in Reb. <laughs> We can totally cut that section out. Don't even worry about it. No, it's, it's fine. Out. It's just when it's live, you just have to keep rolling. And when it's recording, you just have like, oh, let me just redo that. Yeah, no worries. We can just slice this little section out. Dominic's 
a pro. So oh, yeah, no, no, no. I'm, yep. I'm, 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 I'm familiar. I'm just laughing with how much I'm relying on the editor at this point <laughs> compared to, to live. So first, let me talk a little bit about shader uniforms. In regular WebGL1, you add your uniforms to your shader code, and you're able to set each one directly using these uniform API calls. Fairly simple stuff. In WebGL2, while you still can use separate shader uniforms, a much better option is to use what are called uniform buffers, where you group a lot of different uniforms together into one larger structure, and then you send all of that uniform data to the GPU together at the same time. And this is kind of similar to how you might upload a vertex buffer in WebGL1. So this has a few performance benefits. First of all, instead of one API call per uniform, we now have a flat total of two per draw call, one to first bind the buffer and then another one to upload it. And it's actually possible to reduce that number of draw call or number of API calls down even further. Uh, also, this way of grouping uniforms together is actually much closer to how modern GPUs work under the hood. So this means the driver has much less overhead when converting our uniforms into something the GPU can access. In fact, when using Angle with the Direct3D11 backend, the uniform buffers approach maps pretty much directly to the underlying Direct3D11 API calls. And finally, here's WebGPU. The shaders look a little bit different, and that's because the shaders in WebGPU are actually written using a different shading language. And I'll talk about that more in a few slides. But there's actually no support for individual uniforms at all in WebGPU. You only have the option of using uniform buffers. So the first step for me when porting the whole framework over was to first port using WebGL2 and convert almost all of my shaders to using uniform buffers instead of individual uniforms. Uh, and if you can support it, I really, really recommend starting with a port to WebGL2 as an intermediate step, since the transition from that to WebGPU should be quite a bit smoother. Um, because of the new binding model in WebGPU, the code is the code, the JavaScript code is a little bit more complicated, but it should look pretty much otherwise identical. Um, and we only have two API calls per draw call at the bottom there, one to write the buffer and the other to bind it. There's one more additional wrinkle. In WebGL2, you can bind a uniform buffer, draw with it, and then immediately upload new, buffer, uh, new data to that same buffer and draw with it again. This might not seem too uncommon. This is similar to how web uniforms were managed in WebGL1, but with how modern GPUs work, it'll want to keep the data around for pretty much all of the draw calls so it can execute all of them together in parallel. So the fastest way to use WebGPU will not to be basically to not reuse buffers like this. The best approach to do this, if you can manage it, is to upload all of your data into one giant buffer and then bind different parts of that lar larger buffer for each individual draw call. So I ended up writing a simple linear allocator that's able to carve out chunks of a larger uniform buffer. For all of the parameters that can be shared between draws, like global stuff, like the view projection matrix, I was able to reuse that uniform buffer section between individual draw calls so I didn't have to re-upload any shared data. If you're unfamiliar, if you want to bind subsets of a larger uniform buffer in WebGL2, you can use the special API call known as bind buffer range, which takes an offset into the buffer. In WebGPU, in WebGPU there's something similar known as dynamic uniform buffer offsets, where you can actually pass a list of offsets when you call the set bind group API. So next, let's talk a little bit about shaders. When I originally started this port, I used Sphere V shader since I could compile my existing w, uh, GLSL shader code into Sphere V with GL slang. Uh, as the spec has evolved, browsers are now currently in the process of phasing out support for Sphere V shaders, and the, shading, the shaders now have to be written in a new shading language called WGSL. And here's a quick comparison. You can see some GLSL code on top and roughly equivalent WGSL code on the bottom. WGSL is a little bit more, more, more verbose, but I think it's very similar um, in the actual flow control and stuff like that. But now I needed a way to convert my GLSL to WGSL, and I didn't want to do that for every game that I supported by hand. Thankfully, there's a great Rust library called Naga, which helped me do exactly that. So I'm currently compiling my original GLSL shaders to WGSL shaders right in the browser, just in time, using a combination of Naga and WebAssembly. So with this, I was able to get myself bootstrapped well enough to be able to do work on the rest of the port. 
So with that out of the way, I started getting some first renders using WebGPU, which is really exciting. But unfortunately, I started having issues when turning on post-processing as everything started to render upside down. For those of you who've worked on OpenGL to direct 3D ports or vice versa ports before, this is actually a pretty classic problem that you might have seen. But for those who haven't, uh, it's actually still pretty simple once you understand what's really going on. So the web, sorry, excuse me. So the OpenGL specification actually says that when you upload a texture, the array of pixels that you hand to OpenGL actually starts at the bottom left pixels and then goes up from there. It also says that when you sample a pixel in a shader, UV coordinate 00 refers to the bottom left pixel of a texture. In practice, most people upload their texture starting with the top left pixel and sample with 00 referring to that same top left pixel. And so these two upside down mistakes simply cancel each other out. However, when rendering to a frame buffer and then sampling it, OpenGL sets it up so that the bottom left of the frame buffer is actually at the coordinate 00. And then when we go to sample that, we start sampling the pixel at the bottom left of that frame buffer. DirectX and Metal have always used the 00 coordinate to be in the top left, so they don't have this issue. Since it's generally less hassle to put 00 at the top left, and since it matches what most people already do, the WebGPU spec authors decided to adopt that convention as well. And while it's probably worth pointing out that while OpenGL did eventually gain an API call to change to a upper left uh, origin for frame buffers, that only appeared in OpenGL 4.5, and we don't have that API call in WebGL. What this means is that any WebGL code that samples a frame buffer is set up to use a different texture coordinate space than the one that WebGPU is going to expect. In practice, what this means is that when you sample a frame buffer, you'll probably need to flip your coordinates using the classic famous, you know, y equals 1.0 minus y kind of deal. Another similar problem is the clip space depth ranges. Uh, this manifested for me as uh, trials getting sort of clipped sooner in than you might expect them to. So you can see how this water plane and the stone structure on the right is getting cut out a little bit here. This is actually another web GPU difference again, but thankfully this one also has a pretty simple explanation. With a normal frustum, we can see the left of us, to the right of us, above us, and below us. So all of these clip space coordinates are defined to range from negative one to one, with zero being the center point. However, with Z, we can see in front of us, but we actually can't see behind us. So there's a question, what should the range be of the Z coordinate? Um, classically, OpenGL uses the negative one to one range to make it similar to the X and Y coordinates, and WebGL also uses that range. However, Direct3D, Metal, Vulkan all use zero to one. And as it turns out, using zero to one has quite a number of significant advantages. So the WebGPU spec team decided to adopt that clip space convention as well. So how to fix this? Well, the thing that's transforming your model's positions into clip space is going to be your projection matrix. So the easiest way to fix this is to make sure that your projection matrix outputs in a zero to one range. If you're already using a library like GL matrix, there's already an API call for this. Instead of calling perspective, you can call perspective ZO. And there are similar functions for ortho and the other um, a, you know, GL matrix API calls as well. However, sometimes you have an existing projection matrix and you can't change where it comes from. Like if it comes from a WebXR device, the API is gonna hand you a projection matrix sort of naturally. Um, to convert it to a zero to one range, the easiest way to do this is to pre-multiply your projection matrix by this other matrix in the bottom here. To go from negative one to, negative one, to one to zero to one, we have to half the range and then add on another half. And that's just what this matrix is doing. It's just multiplying the Z coordinate. And those are some of the bigger things that I hit. Um, so here's some last words of wisdom for anybody attempting a port from WebGL. First, as I mentioned before, try and upload as much data as you can before rendering a single triangle. This can be a difficult task, but it's gonna make things a lot simpler when porting to WebGPU and a lot faster when uh, using WebGL. And this applies to all data, not just uniform buffers, but uniforms are probably what's gonna be changing the most between frames. So that's where I'd start. Second, uh, caches are super helpful. S saving off the correct render pipelines and bind groups and all of these things might be a challenge to find a good place to put them. And so a hash map that's keyed on the descriptor is a cheap way of saving and retrieving these objects, quote unquote, from scratch without having to go to the platform API to WebGPU and ask it to create you a new object. Um, and third, 
This is a little bit more opinionated, but there's a design of renderer that's popular in the games industry now. I've heard it called draw call objects, and I'll recommend it here as well. Basically, instead of your individual game object render methods directly calling into a platform like draw method, like GL draw elements, instead of doing that directly, they instead allocate all the data they need and push a small draw call object to a list somewhere. That list can then get sorted for transparency or do something else. And you can have multiple different lists if you have multiple different passes. So it's a great way of separating sort of the scene structure from the draw call structure. And it's a great way of handling render orders and multiple passes while only traversing your entire scene, your game objects once. And as a side sort of side benefit, uh, it buffers your draw calls and you can collect all of the uniform data that you need to and upload them once at the start of the uh, start of the frame before you draw, before you execute any of your any of your draw call structures. Finally, Web GPU is still a heavy work in progress, and the browser implementations with WGSL are starting to come up online pretty much right about now. Uh, there's an origin trial in the near future for Chrome, for instance. Uh, note that there's still probably quite a few browser bugs. Uh, and if you have any questions or run into any trouble, I really recommend joining the Web GPU community on matrix.org, and we can try and help you out a little bit there. Uh, last, all of the code I mentioned is completely open source. Uh, both the website itself and the framework I developed for the site. And I hope all this code can be a helpful inspiration for others if they're starting to do their port from WebGL to WebGPU. And that's all I got. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jasper, for that uh, run through and, and, and great work. Um, and so with that, uh, we turn it over to uh, Morris uh, from uh, UX3, or, uh, UX3D will provide the latest news on the GLTF sample viewer. Hello, I'm Moritz Becher, lead GPU software engineer at UX3D. And today I'm gonna to show you the Kronos GLTF sample viewer. GLTF sample viewer is a native GLTF viewer. It's developed alongside the GLTF specification and the GLTF extensions. And native in, with respect to GLTF means we use GLTF directly to feed the renderer. So we, for example, load the textures and buffers directly into GL buffers, GL textures, and there is no re no proprietary renderer data model in between. So GLTF really is our data in this viewer. We use WebGL2 and JavaScript ES6 um, that has a reactive UI with a separated renderer API. GLTF sample viewer is owned by Kronos and licensed under Apache 2. And since 2018, it's mainly developed by UX3D and community contributors. So there are lots of GLTF viewers around. And you may ask, why is there a need for another one? Most of the other viewers are already full-fledged engines or very complex software that can do a lot of things. But GLTF sample viewer has a different focus. So for example, we strive for GLTF spec conformity. This means we almost only implement GLTF or core GLTF and the GLTF extensions. It's not necessarily tuned to look nice. So um, there is, for example, no default tone mapping and no default exposure adaptation. The one exception to uh, this uh, minimalism of only implementing GLTF specification is uh, image-based lighting, which is required to make the PBR materials that are used in GLTF really shine. So another part in a, uh, alongside this GLTF spec conformity is the strive for simplicity. So as GLTF sample viewer serves an educational purpose, we try to keep everything as simple and minimalistic as possible. Hence, we also only implement the core GLTF and extensions. So for example, there is no WebGL1 support just to keep some workarounds that are required for WebGL1 support out of the source code, keeping it simple. GLTF sample viewer also is independent. The Kronos uh, has the IP of it, which has obvious benefits. It also uh, avoids conflicts of interest. So if one company owns a viewer, they might have some interest in, in that viewer and um, it might collide with a different um, viewer's implementation. Sample viewer removes all that and provides a common ground. 
So this way we can use Sample Viewer to synchronize the visual output, for example, for a 3D commerce and come to a mutual consensus on how the output should actually look. GLTF Sample Viewer also serves the purpose of being functional sample code for GLTF. So everything that is stated in the spec should somehow show up in Sample Viewer's source code. This is due to it being a full GLTF uh, viewer. So all GLTFs that are uh, conforming to the spec should open or should be viewable in the sample viewer. It also is a great source of tutorials for all things related to GLTF. So you can look up shaders, you can look up the interpretation of GLTF properties or uh, how resources are loaded. So you as a WebGL developer or enthusiast can use GLTF sample viewer in a couple of different ways. So for example, if you are working on a GLTF implementation, you might have the need for verification of that implementation. So for example, there could be the question, how should a test asset look? So if you, for example, implement this transmission effect that is a, a new extension for GLTF, you might uh, want to have a look at this uh, test asset uh, that is in a uh, GLTF sample models repository, um, transmission test. And you might want to um, move the camera to, for example, the sphere and have a, a close look to how roughness is applied in transmission. And for example, if your viewer or your implementation produces a similar output. And uh, of course, if something goes wrong, you can use this as a reference for debug debugging and so on. You could also use Sample Viewer to showcase new extensions. Let's say you want to extend GLTF. Um, just for example, Viewer, implement the extension there. And you can show this to everybody and the discussion can arise. Sample view can also be used as a quick and easy GLTF preview. So if you drag and drop any GLTF and GLB file, it shows up in the uh, viewer and you can interact with it and tinker settings and so on. Also, the GLTF sample models repository assets are implemented or integrated into UI and they're available via this dropdown over here. So you can select a huge array of uh, models and assets and look at them in the viewer. So let's maybe now look at the at one yeah really important part of sample viewer um, and or actually, actually a really important use case of sample viewer and uh, that is that it helps you to implement the GLTF specification. Um, sample viewer has source code with links to the specification so that you can directly compare the source code with the specification. It uses the same nomenclature as the specification and therefore is quite easy to search. So if you have some, um, yeah, so some words that you want to, have to look up in the source code, you can just search for it. It's, uh, it's going to be the same, same word in sample viewer. So all the results that you find in the source code should somehow relate to the specification. So this can help you getting the, the answers you need quickly. Good example for this is the new extension KHR materials volume, which turns closed mesh surfaces from walls or representing walls to interfaces between volumes. This can be used in combination with KHR materials transmission to get uh, or to refract and, and absorb light. So as you can see here, light passes through this volume and hits the camera, but it is refracted and absorbed in between. So it changes the color and it changes the direction as well. These things, of course, are naturally difficult for rasterizers to implement. And the specification um, sometimes gives you some directions towards an implementation in a rasterizer. For example, using a thickness texture instead of actually computing the distance the ray takes through the volume, but it also has to somehow be implementation agnostic. So the specification doesn't really care if you implement it in a ray tracer or rasterizer. Um, you need, it, it needs to be agnostic to, to the implementation. 
So your question, how do I actually refract the light through a volume and sample from, from behind or change the direction of light in a rasterizer, that may not be answered in a specification. So in this case, you can just have a look at the source code, in this case, the shader. And here you can see, ah, okay, um, the, yeah, refract, the ray is refracted. How, how is that computed? You can look up how attenuation is applied. And you can see that we use a back buffer to get the light behind the volume or to sample behind the volume and, and change the direction of the ray. You can also have a look at the JavaScript rendering pipeline description, for example, to uh, get info about the order of drawing um, the different or the order of the render passes. We have full source code available on GitHub. Um, also, there is an NPM package uh, with the core renderer. And this NPM package can be used together with an, uh, an API to integrate Sample Viewer in a custom web app or to use it in testing frameworks. For example, this has been done with Model Viewer's testing framework, so Sample Viewer is part of that. So let's now have a look at it um, in a quick demo. So here you can see uh, the standard damaged helmet. Uh, that's a default model. And yeah, clicking. Uh, and dragging uh, will rot orbit to camera. You can zoom by uh, scrolling the mouse wheel and holding shift to drag will pan your view. This is kind of a hidden feature. So you can select uh, lots of assets in here. Um, all of them available in the TRTF sample models repository. Um, but let's maybe have a look at the toy car. So here we have this nice little toy car that shows a lot of GLTF extensions and you can cycle through the cameras that are embedded in the GLTF to get some nice views on the toy car. Also, you can uh, just drag and drop some GLB, in this case the Mosquito and Ember, to get some preview on it. Um, so yeah, it looks really nice and you can see already light passing through the volume. But maybe you want to change the view a bit so that it looks more interesting because at the moment this blurred background kind of makes it look a bit dull. So let's navigate to this display tab and here you can disable the environment blur. So now you can look through it and it really suits uh, or it really shows the, the effect. But maybe maybe it's not so typical to, to find this uh, amber in a footprint cord. So let's change the environment by dragging and dropping in HDR. Um, so this takes some time to sample, but now we are at the beach where it's probably much more likely to find this amber. Um, the only thing, the sun now is behind the camera, so uh, the effect doesn't really uh, come, come across that well. So let's, let's change the environment rotation and well, now the sun is behind and we can look through very nicely. We also have um, other tabs that are, for example, used if you have assets with animations, you can toggle which animation is currently playing. And there is a tab that shows the XMP data that can be embedded in TLTF. Um, but what I think is also quite interesting is this advanced controls tab, uh, especially for you developers. So let's say you are using a tone map in your renderer and want to compare that to the sample viewer. Um, we have implemented these three ACES filming tone mappings. This one is uh, the same one that is used in model viewer. And this already improves the quality quite a bit. So let's maybe increase the exposure a bit. So this is an f-stops, an exposure value of one doubles the, the amount of light. So, yeah, looks looks pretty good already. You can disable some effects if you want to. So, for example, you can disable the volume effect. You can disable transmission altogether. So you get a uh, yeah, stone and so on. Um, so what can also be really helpful when debugging 
GLTF implementations is uh, using these debug channels. So in here you get a output of uh, the, in this case, the normal texture on the mesh, or let's say the roughness uh, on the mesh. So you can compare that to your implementation, uh, for example, the output in RenderDoc. So um, that's it with the demo. Um, you can have a look at the webinar by Norbert Nopper, where he goes into much more detail of GLTF sample viewer. And uh, the web app I just demoed is available through this link below, and you can have a look at the source code on GitHub. If you have any more questions, you can contact us via Twitter or visit our website. And yeah, that concludes my talk. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, super impressive at how fast that loaded uh, going through Zoom and everything else for it. So super nice. Um, up next, we're turning over to uh, Sandra uh, Volker from Target, who will show the latest GLTF extension, ATX2, and uh, their advantages to tech artists. Hi, everybody. Um, I am also going to be diving even deeper into that great tool that you just saw from Moritz. And I will be talking about uh, authoring of and creating some of those fantastic assets that he was illustrating. So to introduce myself, uh, Sandra Volker, I am a senior tech artist at Emerging Technologies at Target. Um, there is so much I'd love to talk to you about, but being that I only have the 10 minutes, I won't be able to go too deep, but I will be showing off selections of the latest extensions using real physical products that uh, we have at Target and at other um, uh, e-commerce locations. So we will briefly be exploring a variety of tools available that you can use today to generate those assets. And of course, at the end, I will leave you with a pile of links to resources to help you play with those items with more confidence. So Kronos Group is constantly trying to improve and adding features that help artists create more and more accurate surfaces. Here are some sample models available that more, it's, uh, some of them he's shown you, um, some of them they're, they're available in that list of models in um, the tool that he represented. But we're gonna be looking at some brand new examples. If you've played with this before, you're gonna be seeing some models that you haven't seen before. So it is exciting, good news, good features, but there's always that wait. Features take a little time to mature and in get integrated into all the various applications that could benefit from their use. So sometimes we do have to be a little patient for, for full adoption, but Kronos knows that we're all itching to use the latest technology. So we work closely with partners um, in our group here, and we make sure that they are implementing and able to support some of these latest extensions. So right off the bat, as soon as they are available, you can play. So here are some additional tools that you uh, can see that we are going to be exploring and playing with. So let me show you. Now, this is a live demo, so hopefully it goes smooth. All I have here is a bunch of tabs in Chrome. So I'm going to make that full screen. And then I am going to just shift through some of these tabs and we'll look at products, their development, and the software that I played with and used to create them. So, OK, uh, before some of the new extensions came along, we did, you could make some really impressive, good looking products. So here's a chair um, and it comes in a variety of textures and you can see that item in 3D directly on the target website. But also we can take that model and we can look at it in this tool, the one that you just heard about. So yeah, in, in here we can do things like changing lighting and changing effects and really being able to look at it super closely so we can see how that seam comes together, what the textures look like, and analyze things with more detail. This particular model was uh, could be 
used in and built and authored in Maya and exported via the Babylon Beauty Studio Max uh, exporter. Um, this is one of those cases, though, where I, I'm hoping pretty soon Babylon updates their exporters, because right now there's limited extensions available, but fingers crossed, this will be getting updated soon and we'll have even more functionality. But don't worry, there's other ways to take advantage of the new tech. So here's something that was a struggle. Something like glass, that transparent, that volume, the refraction, all the things that go into defining glass. Without any of the new extensions, using some tricks with reflections and or the metallic property, you could start to get something that was representative of glass, but it just wasn't um, you know, clear as to what it was. So yay, new extension, we have transmission. So for all of these extensions, uh, at the end of this presentation, I do have links so that you can see where all of them are um, and you can read about them. You can see images, sample code, sample models. So it'll have everything you need to do this at home. If we add transmission feature, just that one extension alone to that same glass vase, it ends up looking so much better. And that's just one extension. This glass vase was done in Blender. So Blender supports clear code. It supports transmission. Um, go to the link at the end of this and it'll, you can find a whole list of some of the newer features that are supported directly in Blender. So for each of these assets, I tried a different technique to export them. So I wanted to illustrate you the variety of ways we can create these assets. But here's another one that's a challenge. Sure, it's glass, it's got the volume and refraction, but look at that specular color, that iridescence. So how can we capture that? With the new extension called specular, of course. <laughs> and so now we can take that glass model that has the translucency or sorry, transmission, but by adding that specular color, you can see the difference. So here's another fantastic feature with the um, GLTF viewer. Under advanced features, you can go in and you can test the different newest extensions and see how they're affecting your model. So in this case, I can turn transmission on and off and I can turn specular color on and off. So you can really see how that new extension is affecting the model. How did I add specular color? It's a texture map. It gets applied via the new feature. And yeah, I kind of created this oily kind of color to kind of emulate the look. You know, I know it's uh, physically based materials, but there's still artistry involved in replicating some of these looks. But that glass isn't just transmission and specular color, it's also volume. So if we start playing with that volume extension, now you can kind of see how the lid starts to form deform, uh, refract would be the proper term behind the glass there. So if I messing with the volume and kind of see that refraction happening, that thickness, and of course we still have transmission and we still have specular color. So as you start to combine these different extensions, you can really create interesting looks. How to get that volume, it's another texture map. So it's darker where it's thin and it's lighter where it's thick. So I took another model and started just playing with it too. So that last glass jar didn't actually have wax in it, right? So a real jar would if this was a candle. So how would we add that wax and how would it look as it's being refracted through this sort of crystalline glass? Here is a, an example that will be coming live in our um, sample models soon. Um, done by a fellow tech artist. And this is, yeah, it's got all the bells and whistles here. We got animation, we got specular color, we got volume, we got transmission, we got pretty metallics, and of course, olives. Who doesn't like olives? Well, not everyone likes olives, but I do. Um, so another extension to explore, sheen. The challenge here is to make surfaces look soft, warm, and inviting. So I found this model and I just played with it a little bit in using the sheen. Again, just wanted to show you, here's the 
right? Example models and everything you need to be able to do it. Um, but I was playing with this inside uh, Substance, Substance, the new Substance Stager product. So it just came out in June and um, Adobe is a wonderful partner with Kronos Group and we're working closely together to make sure as they come out with their new Substance products that they support these new features. So just playing around in Substance real quick. Um, it's not exactly the same product, but we got a kind of a similar look here. I did this in a matter of minutes, honestly, guys. So uh, the artist side of me goes, oh, I could add more specular color to the satin and I could, you know, but I, the point here is I'm illustrating this sheen look. So you can see how that kind of makes things softer and more gentle. I actually did start playing with specular color to see how I could separate the brightness of the satin from the softness. So just because it's color, you can also start messing with intensity. Again, this is an art form, so you start playing. Let's see, what else do I have next? Let's talk about another extension, and that is clear coat. So like car paint, so shiny metal, um, you know, it gets that sort of that extra polish and sheen to those surfaces. So. I didn't actually have the model for this one, but here's the documentation. It exists, look it up. But I did have this little kitty can. Now, what if next year the design for this can, they wanted to make it extra polished. They wanted to give it a different look. Well, no problem. We can go into here and this is what the can looks like without clear coat, but if we add that clear coat can really see how it adds that polish and shine. Now, as I mentioned, for each of these examples, I was using a different technique and different software. So in this one, I used Visual Studio Code um, with the Cesium plugin. So um, Cesium is fantastic. You can flip through the different viewers and you can really kind of get in there and edit the code. There's just a fantastic, this is just a, one of my favorite ways, if you're not gonna be working in a graphics application, but rather directly in the JSON GLTF file itself, I highly recommend this setup, it's great. So there are more features I would love to talk about, but due to time, I cut a few out. So maybe if there's a webinar or some other presentation, I'd be happy to give and talk about even more of those extensions coming up. But one thing I wanted to touch on, really important, is as these new effects come online, this means more data can be getting added to your GLTF. But we need to keep these files light and portable. So how do we add more effects and add more good golden stuff, but keep these files small? And KTX compression in the latest version 2.0 to the rescue. So. What I wanted to talk about is how KTX2 compression, and I'm gonna show you a quick example of two different assets that as you can see here with and without compression, how that file size really was affected. Just to show you an example, sometimes you can generate a GF as more and more 3D uh, software, authoring content creation software, uh, supports and enables GLBs within their pipeline, it's great, you can export GLBs, but sometimes they aren't really set up to be optimal for real-time performance. But when you're working with designers who are really, I mean, they're, they've spent a lot of love and care into these products. They really want these 3D models to represent the work that they put into it. You can't just you know, do your typical decimate and reduce texture file size because they're gonna notice and they're gonna come back and they're gonna say, mm, my stitches look soft. I can't see the mesh in my skirt, right? So how do we make that file smaller? I think this one was what, 32 megs? And if I go to the next tab, this one was, what was it again? Five megs, not even four and a half. But going back, if we look at this, you know, they still were okay. Gosh, we've got the texture there. We've got the seams up here, those details that matter to our designers. I think we're gonna be okay when this is the KTX2 compression settings. KTX2 is, can be run command line and there's a lot of different options. So you can make it work for the size and detail levels that you need. 
So just another like a standard hard good that came out of uh, 3D Studio Max. Um, we have this lamp. So it's gonna start at close to eight megabytes and it's gonna end at less than one. So this is your standard lamp, uh, the original one. And this is the, what, I don't even know the percentage. What is that, like a, te a tenth of the size? And I, my gosh, like it's really hard to tell the difference if I flip between the two. So it's this, an amazing way to bring your files down and keep them portable, which after all, isn't that part of the goal of all this too, is to make sure we have assets that can be used and ported throughout the system. So I will go back into my slides because in order for you to do this at home, you need resources. You need to know where those documents are and know where those links are. So where can we find information about these latest extensions? Uh, the top link is the ones that are all sort of ratified and ready to go. But if you are, you know, pushing the edges and want to find out what's up and coming, please feel free to look at that second link to see um, what's in progress. You can also find lots of models. I learn by seeing what's been done. So the large repository of sample models is a fantastic resource. Dig into that, look at that, see where it takes you. General sort of documentation when I'm working with newer tech artists and I'm kind of explaining to them how all this works. These are some links that I might send them to. Um, that first link, I think it was written in like 2017, um, but you know what, it, it, it is a fantastic resource. It has great uh, diagrams and illustrations. Um, then if you want to constantly being updated, working hard, the 3D Commerce Group is, has their asset creation guidelines. That goes into lots of the details, but it is an important document to understand if you are working in a larger pipeline scenario and want to be sure to create accurate models. Physically based rendering is something a little bit newer for those folks who may have come from a, um, a different background or are still just learning 3D and starting out. So um, I often will send out these resources to help guide those folks. Uh, let's see here, digital content creation software. So I do want to point out that every studio has a unique pipeline need and that pipeline need will drive their software choices. So every day, more and more software is putting GTL, GLTF into their arsenal. But here are the links that I used to generate the GLTF assets you saw in this presentation. So this is not by any means exclusive. It's just what you saw here today. If you want to play with those options, I want to send you some links, as well as the the more specialized uh, GLTF editing code. Um, you saw me working the Visual Studio code in the Cesium. Uh, there's a great tool called Gestaltor that is um, created by the same folks that you saw the web uh, viewer that I was using, or the, yeah, the web GLTF viewer. Um, even, you know what, if you're the kind of person who just doesn't like to type, I recently discovered this node material editor by Babylon JS, and now you can link nodes and work in a node-based format. Um, uh, and I know some, uh, some, some folks who prefer that. So uh, they are also command line converters that will quickly take your assets from various, exported out of various formats such as uh, OBJ or FBX and turn them into GLTFs. Um, those can be very handy for bulk conversion, but they do rely on translation rules that can limit some of your creative control. So they definitely have their place, but you are gonna have to learn about what they're looking at and how they translate those different formats. Um, and then last but not least, talking about the KX2 compression, uh, there's a great artist guide that has example um, uh, command line, like example settings that you can use to get different results. Um, this uh, goes into more of those details. And then um, our partners at Wayfair have put together a couple great examples that go into the different settings and how they look. So yeah, my job at Target is to empower artists. Actually, my job in my career for the last 26 years is how can I empower artists to create amazing looking products that are powerful and inspiring, yet accessible and simple. GLTF format is the tool that's helping us get there. So thanks. And yeah, I think that's all she wrote for me. So I appreciate your time. That was 
Awesome. Thank you for that presentation showing us um, how y'all are using that. And, um, and again, all the great information for artists out there. Uh, so yeah, I'm sure we'll have some questions in the Q&A for that. Don't forget folks, uh, please do put your questions uh, in the Q&A and we'll make sure to get to those um, after our next two speakers. And so up next, we have uh, Philip Taylor from Zia. We'll present on leveraging multi-draw to speed up rendering of many small objects. Um, so let's just run through this. Um, I've got a lot of slides, I'm gonna move quickly. Um, in our business, we tend to deal with design data, which comes large data sets, which have tons and tons of small parts. So drawing performance is really critical. So I'm just gonna discuss what does a draw call normally constitute? You start by binding a shader of some kind, then you bind the geometry, then you set up some uniforms. These might include material parameters and matrices, and then you issue the draw call. Now, the challenge is that as the number of draw calls goes up, most renderers performance starts falling off a cliff. Um, when you start going above, say, 3,000 draw calls, uh, we start seeing that the real limitation of the render is not actually the number of triangles, but it's the number of draw calls and the cost that each draw call in, in, in incurs. So, uh, you know, the performance of the GPU becomes less and less of a factor, and really it's the speed at which, we, which you can feed the GPU becomes the most important aspect of your performance. Uh, let's keep going. So rendering optimizations. When people look at how to speed up their renderer, there's a few things you might think about. Reducing the number of drawn triangles, basically reducing the complexity of each, each geometry through level of details. Reducing the cost of each draw call. So there's things like uniform buffers, vertex object, buffer objects. These, these tools allow you to reduce the cost of each individual draw call. And then there's batching techniques. When it comes to reducing the number of draw calls, we've got tools like fresh from culling, you know, not drawing things that are off screen, occlusion culling, drawing, not drawing things that are behind other objects. And there's instancing. And instancing is where you might group together many different drawn objects into one single draw call. Um, and that's a good way to get lots of things on screen quickly. And the next, the new feature we have in WebGL is a new extension called uh, multi-draw. Multi-draw allows you to draw lots of different objects all at once. So if instancing is basically drawing one geometry many times at different locations, um, multi-draw is allowing you to draw lots of different geometries multiple times. So it actually has a, gives you a lot more power in terms of how to um, leverage the GPU. Now, I worked on the Warcraft movie and in general, I mostly worked on the crowd battle simulation software for the, for the big battle scenes, but I also worked on a renderer to render the, the film sets. And we wanted to try and get, as, get just all of the data for the film sets on screen as fast as possible to, to do layout. We weren't trying to mimic lighting or anything like that. We just wanted as much geometry on the screen. So I based the renderer on this article called The Road to a Million Draws. And in there, there was some sample code leveraging the new, uh, at the time, OpenGL 4.5 tool um, extension called Multi-Draw Elements Indirect. Uh, if you want to learn about Multi-Draw, that's actually a great place to start. Um, and that's where I started learning about Multi-Draw. And we, the renderer was super fast, very simple, but very fast. And um, it was my first experience with multi-draw. So when I learned that multi-draw was coming to WebGL, I was super excited. I was actually skeptical it would actually make it right in, but last year it landed and I was super excited. So just a quick overview of our renderer's architecture before we started working on multi-draw. So we have a scene tree, your, basically your data model. It's a tree structure, much like a, you know, the DOM tree in the browser. Uh, within that tree, you might find what we call geom items and geom items combine a material and a geometry together and you can have multiple geom items share a material or share geometries and then we have a renderer which is kind of like a compiler it takes that scene tree and generates a more efficient structure for rendering so the renderer will actually group uh, objects according to which shaders they use and they'll group, group them together according to which materials they use and then they'll group them together according to which geometries. And this allows us to automatically infer instancing. Um, so our render is all, always just if, able to generate instancing whenever it sees multiple geometries being used. And this obviously had some improvement in performance, but not really as much as we we're hoping. Um, you know, it's, it's still we started seeing performance dropping as we get, got past those 3,000 unique draw calls. And there was a limit to how many instances we could extract out of a given scene. So multi-draw. Multi-draw has so much promise, but how do you actually use it? The first challenge with multi-draw is that you have to 
you're basically drawing one geometry using offsets within that geometry to select sort of sub parts of the geometry. So all your geometries have to be packed into one large vertex bucket. And that was the first challenge. Um, all of the, these geometries, once they're packed, also have to share the same precision. You can't just kind of mix and match different kind of precision values. And um, you also, once you're starting to use multi-draw, you can't change uniforms in between draw calls. You're just assuming that the GPU is going to run through and draw all of these items one after the other. So you can't kind of tell it to change materials or change any other aspects. And the other thing is, you know, you know there's a complex management of um, how to, you, the, the instance I, instancing is sort of kind of orthogonal a little bit. You've got this draw ID, which gets fed in per draw call. And that's the only thing that you have to uniquely identify each draw call. Now, um, so geometry library. To be able to pack all geometries into one big library, the first thing we need to do is say, as we're detecting geometries, as we parse our scene structure, when we find a geometry, we would now have to pack it into one large buffer. So that means we take all the vertex attributes calculate the slot within this geometry buff they need to be, put them in there, and then offset all the indices for that same geometry so that the new indexes actually match the new positions of those vertex attributes in the, in the buffer. Um, so this, this was the first thing, push, putting all these geometries into one buffer. And we're looking to do this at scale. We're talking tens of thousands of geometries in one large buffer. So we wrote something called the allocator class. The allocator class is, job is to keep track of all of the different geometries which exist within these large vertex attribute buffers and uh, the indices buffers. Uh, so we might allocate a bunch of different geometries. Here we've got four geometries allocated into our single buffer. Then one of them might get removed. It might be removed from the scene or it might be resized. So it no longer fits its original slot. So we have to allocate a new slot for this new geometry, which actually might cause the entire buffer to need to grow. So we in implemented kind of the container of the, the vertex attribute buffers would resize always using a power of two resize. So setting up at four, eight, 16, 32. This means that this is based on the um, C++ standard template library uh, vector class, how it resizes uh, the storage in the background to minimize the number of times you resize. Because every time we resize the buffer, we'd have to actually re-upload all of the geometries in the scene. Um, to the GPU. So that's a huge cost we're trying to uh, avoid. What's also interesting is that geometries, when they resize, can be moved into existing slots. To avoid um, having to grow the buffer, buffer all the time, we would say if, if a geometry resizes but there's already a slot, we'll move it into an existing slot. Uh, or if a new geometry is uploaded that fits into a, a gap in the geometry buffer, we would just put it in there. And that actually leads to this problem that um, operating systems have had to deal with, which is fragmentation. Eventually, this, these vertex attribute buffers would start having only lots of small slots left. No, no big slots are available. And um, this is called fragmentation, uh, which becomes inefficient. At some point, your memory becomes so fragmented, you need to do a defragment, which is where you kind of start compacting everything together and try to create some big holes again, because those are the holes that you, if you will need if you have to load a new geometry. So the allocated class was the first thing to get right. And we did uh, worked on that for a while, um, tested it thoroughly, and then started moving on. Uh, material packing, as I mentioned, you can't switch uh, uniforms between draw calls. And we didn't really want to have a simple everything. We, could, we wanted to be able to draw as much data as possible with only one draw call. So we decided we'd start moving our material definitions into textures. I know there's probably other ways of dealing with this, but this was the approach we took. So uh, a given material, like here's our standard PBR material definition, gets packed into three uh, pixels within a texture. And then these are loaded at runtime. So in, during render time, based on the given material, we can then load these parameters and actually um, allow us to switch materials dynamically within the shader without um, needing to upload new, new uniforms. Um, so we might have several hundred materials uh, but actually they fit into a pretty small texture. We have this exception where if you have a material that has textures aside, assigned like roughness, specular textures, we can't use multi-draw. And those material, and those geometries actually fall back to the old pipeline where they use this, the, the standard pipeline. In our use cases, we almost never see textures coming along. Our data comes straight out of CAD offering software where textures are not considered um, an important aspect. 
And so it's really just raw geometry with colors assigned. So each shader that's being written has to specify how it's going to pack its values into, uh, pack its material values into the texture. And then it also has to know how to unpack them. We only have a couple of collection of simple, fairly simple shaders. So this is not a big challenge. Now, we have a lot of geometries we're going to render on screen. We want to keep track of each of these geometry, these what's called a draw item. And so we have a texture which packs all of the different draw, draw values. So uh, each, each draw item actually utilizes um, eight um, pixels in total. The first one just collect, contains a couple of uh, important indices. Uh, one of the most important one is, of course, material ID, which is used to index the materials later. And we actually store the model matrix for each uh, drawn item in that texture. Uh, we also store the bounding box for, um, for some other purposes. But the idea here is we're moving away from using any sort of uniforms, moving everything into textures, and then unpacking uh, the data at runtime in, from these textures. Now, uh, to actually feed multi-draw, you need to provide an array of um, offsets and counts into your vertex attributes. So if you've got this big vertex attribute buffer, which contains maybe say 10 geometries in there, you need to specify each time you're going to, each time an object is drawn, which indices is going to reference from, from those, um, that buffer. So we, we have to maintain uh, off, uh, offsets and counts for each drawn item. Now, what's interesting is that this a drawn item might draw a given geometry, but several different draw items might draw the same geometry, similar to instancing, um, or they might draw different geometries. So the draw element um, offsets and counts is actually the number of drawn objects, not the number of geometries. It's something to kind of get you get more used to this as you work with it, um, and. These re represent all of the drawn objects for a given what we call a draw set. So a draw set is everything drawn in a given draw invocation. Um, and you might have a collection of these. We actually try to keep these to a minimum. Most of the time, there's only about four or five draw sets in total um, for, a, for a given scene. Um, I'm going to keep going. I'm running a bit short on time. So this is the shader flow. During the actual drawing in the shader, Given the draw ID, that's the only input we have. We look at the draw set texture, which tells us this is the actual ID of the item from our geom item library, draw item library. From there, we can select the material ID and pull out the, the model matrix. We pass the material ID down into the fragment shader where it then indexes the material materials texture or pulls out base color, roughness, and metallic uh, values and runs that through the PBR lighting pipeline. Interestingly, my big concern was when we did this is we're doing lots of what you call dependent texture uh, lookups. So in other words, one texture lookup depends on another texture lookup and so forth. And this could cause huge performance slowdown. But given that draw ID is considered uniformly varying, I believe that we're get, getting a lot of caching from the texture units in the system and the performance is actually excellent. Okay, so sorting is actually another challenge. How do we, can we use multi-draw within a tra rendering transparent objects? And yes. Um, transparent objects, all we need to do is sort those offsets and counts arrays into new the order, the order that we want to render, then we invoke a single multi-draw and boom, all, all those geometries are now on screen in the order that they were uh, specified. Um, so this works quite well and allows us to draw many thousands of transparent objects at once. So this is what our engine architecture looks like now. We have a geom item library which tracks all of the items in the whole scene. Not not per draw set, but the entire scene. We have a geom item, a geom library, which attracts all the geometries which we've discovered in the entire scene, and a material library, which tracks all of the materials. So these just big, big buffers that keep track of everything. They're just textures. And then we have draw sets associated with each shader that then knows how to draw the geometries it was assigned. Uh, this re results in a very simple, short uh, render loop. We're just looping over a few draw sets and invoking multi-draw one at a time to get all these things on screen. Now, we did some analysis of our renderer against some other renderers just to compare. Um, and we're always focusing on large numbers of objects. So in this graph here, those numbers at the bottom, 10,000 parts is actually pretty small. 20,000 parts is a standard data set for us. And we've seen data sets up to 160,000 parts. So we're always looking at the, the right side of this graph. And as you can see, our with the multi-draw pipeline, uh, our renderer performance holds up pretty well. And we're probably 
getting close to being bottleneck really by the performance of the GPU rather than, than the cost of those draw calls. And most renderers tend to fall off a cliff and become unusable by about 10,000 10, uh, draw calls. Okay, so here's an example scene. This is 17,000 unique geometries, uh, draw, draw calls, uh, 2.5 million triangles. It's not actually a heavy geometry in terms of triangles. There's about 300 materials in here, but we can draw the entire scene with only two draw calls, two multi-draw calls. <laughs> Interestingly, one for the surfaces and one for all the lines. And this gives us a good 60 frames per second, uh, you know, even on, on, on a regular laptop. Uh, we do also have a few other optimizations going like occlusion culling and, uh, and so on. To, to speed up the rendering. Um, the other thing we wanted to figure out is what happens when multi-draw isn't available. And what we implemented is what, what I'm referring to as multi-draw emulation, which is a simple tight loop, which invokes the same draw calls as if multi-draw was invoking them. And what we found is amazingly, the performance was really, really quite good. Not too far off multi-draw, about 30% slower, but still pretty good. And what that shows is that actually most of the bit performance improvements we achieved were actually due to eliminating all uh, geometry, material, and draw item bindings in between draw calls. By eliminating all of that, we got most of our performance. The multi-draw gives us another little boost, but actually what's interesting here is this code path runs in WebGL1 on Safari, and that, those 17,000 parts give us about 36 frames per second um, on an iPad Pro. Uh, um, so that, that's actually pretty, pretty good. I did not expect to get this whole vehicle loading on an iPad, uh, but it works. So to finally wrap up, and I've run out of time, um, it's not a trivial thing to take advantage of. Multidraw is a lot of work. Um, it, it comes with these limitations, like how do you actually uh, manage materials? It's not simple. You end up wasting a lot of memory because you have to convert everything to one unified precision. Um, for example, if there's, we, we had GLTF models being loaded um, with interleaved data, and we had to de-interleave the data to be able to load them into our uniform, our, our shared buffers. So that was an example of where, you know, we actually have to make the data sort of less optimal to actually use it with a multi-draw, but the performance was super good anyway. Um, and actually, if I could have one wish list, it would be to make, to introduce the concept of indirect draw calls, which would be really nice so that you don't actually have to man maintain these arrays and instead you could actually have a GPU buffer driving the draw calls. And that's what we have in with uh, OpenGL 4.5. So I think uh, that's it for now. Sorry, the video didn't work, um, but it just shows a couple of people floating around this vehicle in VR. So it's important to note that the performance we get opens up new use cases. So collaborative virtual reality experiences within massive data sets is suddenly possible. Um, and of course, we're using WebXR for that. And uh, it's just really exciting. So the customers we're talking to just, just love this, um, what they can see coming through this uh, sort of performance we've achieved in the browser. I think that's it for, for me. If there's any question, uh, questions, feel free to send them to me after the call, after the um, presentations are finished. Fantastic. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, uh, Philip. Uh, that was um, massive indeed. So uh, uh, thanks for running us through that. Uh, super great work. And then uh, to bring us home, we have uh, Brendan Duncan from Unity, who will demonstrate how he enabled GPU instancing with WebGL using Unity's SRP batchers. So um, Brendan, when you are ready. Hi, my name is Brendan Duncan. I'm a software engineer for Unity. I'm going to be sharing with you some details about a project we worked on for the WebGL platform called SRP Batcher. It's a strange sounding name, but I'll be explaining what it is. In essence, it's a way of optimizing rendering using uh, batching techniques. A quick disclaimer, everything I'm gonna be talking about here is informational only. It's all in works for being released uh, as part of Unity, but since it hasn't, actually been released yet. Everything is subject to change and everything is in true and but don't hold us to it if anything does change. For anybody unfamiliar about Unity, it's a real-time engine and editor and our goal is to make the world a better place by bringing more creators into it. One of the things that Unity supports to do this is that we support over 25 different platforms and technologies. 
everything from low end mobile to high end PCs and consoles. And my favorite, the web, which is the platform that I work on. We care about all these platforms. And one of the challenges for supporting this level of multi platform is feature parity of getting the various different features of Unity to work similarly and reliably on all, all these different types of platforms. I'm going to be talking about one of these features and how it relates to the web. The web has a lot of challenges to it, and sometimes we have to be creative with the solutions to get the features to work on these platforms. So what problem are we trying to solve? There's lots of ways of optimizing rendering performance for different types of scenes. A lot of times you can use techniques like GPU instancing, where you draw the same object many times and you only have to set it up once. The GPU takes care of rendering it the multiple times. That only works well if the geometry is the same, the materials are the same. Other techniques like batching can be used where you set up the shader once and then you draw multiple geometries at different locations using that shader. Sometimes you have to update uniforms like the object position transformation matrix for each object. This works well if all the objects are sharing similar materials, but it doesn't work well in cases where every object has a unique material and unique material properties because you're losing advantage of the batching because you're doing a lot of work per material per object. So I'm going to bench show a benchmark case here with this worst case scenario of 1600 objects, real time lighting, shadow map, and every single object has a, a different shape and a different material with different random material properties. Here we can see that the rendering is about 33 milliseconds per frame on average, about 30 frames a second, which isn't bad, but it's not great. This is a high-end desktop computer and all it's doing is just rendering these shapes. So we're gonna see if we can optimize this worst case scenario. What is SRP Batcher? SRP Batcher is a feature of our scriptable rendering pipeline, which is our newer rendering engine inside of Unity. It's a very flexible rendering engine and can do a lot of things to optimize rendering performance automatically for you. One of the things that it can do is this SRP Batcher. What it does is it takes all these different objects that have different materials and if they follow certain rules like all the materials use the same shader variants, meaning they all have the same tex have textures assigned to them or use the same properties like accepting shadows, then they can all be batched together, even if they though they have different material properties set for them. By doing this, S SRP can reduce the CPU overhead because any pr material properties per object that don't change can stay persistent in the GPU and don't need to be transferred from the CPU to the GPU. We can all automate all this so that it doesn't require any input from the user to get this performance benefit. It all happens as long as the shader involved meets certain requirements. These requirements are talked about in the documentation for SRP Batcher. The only things that need to do to be changed per object per frame from the CPU is the object's transformation matrix and a couple of other built-in properties. Because of this reduced CPU overhead of not having to update per material properties and drawing all the objects together in single batches, we can drastically improve CPU performance and the rendering performance of the scene itself. How does SRP Batcher work? Well, it works with creating large uniform buffers that 
are assigned per shader. All the objects using the shader variant, even if they use different versions of the shader through materials, share this one shader binding. All the per object built-in properties like the matrix of the object get updated per frame in one in the CPU pass. Any material properties that don't change got updated one time at the beginning and don't need to be ever changed again unless those material properties change. If you change materials color or shininess, then those specific properties per specific object can be updated. And if those don't change every frame, then you get all this performance benefits. So what prevented all this from working with WebGL? WebGL uses a very specific version of OpenGL shading language, GLSL. It uses GLSL ES 3.0, but SRP Batcher required some features of GLSL that weren't available until GLSL 3.1. These features being uniform layout locations and buffer binding points, explicit buffer binding points. These allow the shader to define exactly what locations a specific uniform or uniform buffer get bound to that then the program doesn't need to query and can be reliable that those uniforms will be persistent across any variant of that shader. Because WebGL2 doesn't support these types of features, we were never able to enable SRP Batcher for WebGL. So that's the challenge that we're going to take is to figure out how we can enable these features even though they aren't supported by WebGL2 natively. If we take a look at the shader requirements for SRP Batcher by looking at a snippet of a shader code generated for a shader by Unity, we can see certain things that are happening. One, Unity uses macros and preprocessor defines for everything because it's using the shader for different platforms and can enable and disable certain features based on that. The other thing we notice is that in this case when SRP Batcher is being used, the layout directive for the uniform buffers are defining explicit binding points and the layout directive for uniforms are declaring explicit uniform locations. One of the challenges with WebGL and why it doesn't support that is that OpenGL uses integers for uniform locations and WebGL uses opaque objects, WebGL uniform location objects that don't expose the location that it's actually being used under the hood. It does this for various security reasons, legitimate reasons, but because of that and this indirectness on the way that WebGL handles shaders and OpenGL handles shaders, it can't support this feature of explicit binding locations. If you set the binding location of zero for a uniform, that doesn't mean anything to WebGL because it does, WebGL doesn't understand what location zero is. But we can look at that and figure out a way that we can work around that. One of the ways that we can work around that is that Unity uses Inscription to compile Unity engine and user code into WebAssembly. Inscription bridges OpenGL to WebGL. It uses a dictionary association of integer OpenGL locations and associates those integer locations with WebGL's opaque objects. We can extend Inscription to emulate the required features, and that's what we did. We took Mscripten at the point where the shader is submitted to OpenGL and Mscripten is taking that shader and passing it to WebGL. The shader as it is coming from Unity with the SRP features enabled would error out normally when it's set to WebGL because it doesn't support those shader directives. So what we do is we pre-process the shader in Inscription as it gets sent, the shader gets sent to Inscription to be submitted to WebGL. 
we expand all those macro directives because in the Unity's case, those layout directives were hidden behind macros. We identify the layout directives associating uniform locations and buffer binding points to explicit locations. We remove those from the shader and we update Inscriptum's dictionary association of integer locations to WebGL resources so that when OpenGL accesses a, a uniform or a buffer by a specific location, Inscriptum is doing the correct association. If we look at the shader as it got pre-processed by this Inscriptum extension, we can see that the macros all got expanded. The layout directives got removed from the shader. And so when the shader is submitted to WebGL, it compiles correctly. Inscriptum has pulled out the location and binding locations from these directives and updated its associative map with that information. And now, everything works as if it were done natively by OpenGL. As far as Unity is concerned, Inscripted is now supporting these 3.1 features, even though under the hood, WebGL is only supporting 3.0 features. Inscripted is doing the work of translating between the two. So now because of this, Unity sees WebGL as a 3.1 capable platform. It, we can enable SRP Batcher for it. Everything automatically gets translated. Mscripten is acting as the intermediary translator and has very little overhead to do that because it's not doing anything additional that it wasn't doing before, except for this preprocessor step, which happens at the beginning. If we run our, excuse me, if we run our benchmark test here, we now get 16 millisecond per frame on average, 60 frames a second on that exact same frame scene without having made any changes to the scene itself. All the processing and batching has happened under the hood for the user. It supports a very flexible range of scenes and behaviors that are common in the wild projects, such as variants of objects having different material properties and lots of those objects to fill out populate scenes. And it can do all this automatically. And in this worst case scenario, we got a 2x performance boost, which is uh, pretty awesome for something that happens without any easier input. So for now we can get the fast rendering with the SRP Batcher. We are reducing our CPU overhead, which has significant benefits, especially for lower end platforms such as mobile, which is a mobile is a very important area that we're working on for web and something that is frequently asked for by reducing CPU overhead and improving rendering performance, we can improve uh, the types of projects that can be run at higher frame rates on these lower end devices. We can overall improve rendering performance for complex scenes on all platforms. All of this is done automatically by Unity with little input from the user. The only requirement is that the shader be compatible with SRP Badger. Those requirements are described in the documentation for SRP Badger on Unity's documentation. All of this is coming soon in Unity 2021.2. It's all in the release queue and will be released shortly. The option for SRP Badger is a feature of Universal Rendering Pipeline, which is a SRP rendering for WebGL and it's on by default. So in the rendering settings for your project, you can enable and disable this feature to turn it on or off depending on your needs. Any shader that does not support SRP Batcher has no impact from any of these changes. 
I want to give a special thank you to Yuka Yolanki for making all these changes that we made to Mscripten open source and part of the Mscripten package itself. You, anybody can use these features of enabling these WebGL, GLSL uh, explicit binding locations. Uh, all you have to do is enable the extensions from Mscripten. The documentation for these extensions are in the Mscripten docs on the Mscripten source code in GitHub. Here are a couple links to Unity's documentation on SRP Badger and a blog that was written describing SRP Badger, where you can find more technical details about SRP Badger. And that's all I have. So thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, that was a fantastic presentation. Um, looks like we have some uh, about nine minutes uh, for some uh, Q&A. So um, let's go ahead and uh, just uh, address these. And then um, uh, the first one is, is for Yuki. So yes, uh, all these uh, questions uh, and answers are excellent and uh, they will be published later. So uh, make sure just to check the Chrono site uh, for uh, the WebGL event and you'll find it there. Um, this one from uh, Leonard. One of the issues with shared models, but different applications is getting a consistent look across all of those applications running in different environments. I know that Kronos has a certification program for applications. What is being done at the web GPU layer and lower to provide a consistent environment? Whoever would like to take that one. Uh, hi, this is Ken. I'll uh, try to answer this. So WebGPU, like WebGL, has a uh, thorough conformance suite that is still under development. Um, in, in my opinion, it's easier to rigorously test the behavior of shaders and uh, texture sampling and you know, how exactly the rendering pipeline works in one of these imperative APIs like WebGL or WebGPU, as opposed to trying to standardize exactly how a given renderer for a high level 3D model description works. And so with WebGL today, you are pretty much guaranteed uh, identical performance across a wide range of hardware because of all of the resolution of undefined behavior in the OpenGL ES specifications that was done in WebGL and tested by the conformance suite. And so you can trust that WebGPU is going to have a similar level of rigor in its testing, and then applications that you build on top of it will have portable behavior. Awesome. Uh, next question we have, um, how is the performance of the SRP batcher scene on mobile? That one for you, Brennan. All right, yeah. Um, so we're still doing a lot of testing with mobile and performance testing. Mobile is a, a broad subject. There's a lot of different devices, but we are seeing significant rendering performance in the cases where SRP batcher has benefit and it will be a big part of our mobile push. Perfect. And then um, does this new SRP batcher also support WebGL1? Unfortunately, no, bec because uh, of the other requirements for SRP batcher that are happening under the hood. The extensions that we made to Mscripten for the GLSL features do work for WebGL1. So other people can benefit from those features, um, SRP Batcher itself does require WebGL2. Awesome. And, and uh, I, I too had uh, this question in case people did miss it um, over, uh, it was answered, but a good one. Um, when do you think WebGPU can be used for production? Uh, Kai answered this pretty well in the Q&A, but uh, Chrome at least is going to ship a, an origin trial in an upcoming release soon that will allow a given website to sign up for a key that will allow it to use WebGPU on uh, Chrome instances out there in the wild. Uh, and then it's gonna be turned off for a while while we gather user feedback. And then the first versions of the official WebGPU spec will be shipping in browsers, hopefully the beginning of next year. Fantastic. Um, and then of course, how do you get such great quality 3D landscapes and objects? Um, uh, this I guess would be for our, um, Artist on board, Sandra here. I think uh, Eric had a pretty one higher artist, but if anyone wants to uh, answer uh, this one for John. Uh, 
lots of trial and error, you no, know, and watching performance, um, building a space and textures, keeping in mind sort of that simpler, older school game dev limitations, um, because you want to keep things simple to work on all the different computers and files. So even though you might be on a capable computer that can draw some complex um, models and spaces, it is kind of a challenge to kind of keep yourself pulled back to keep it smaller and simple so that it is very portable. Great. And it um, looks like we have a few more questions here. Uh, looks like um, Lewis has a question if uh, anytime soon they'll see a browser version of the Unity engine itself. I assume you mean the Unity the editor application? Uh, -huh. uh not likely. Um, there's a lot of downsides to doing that and there's a lot of work to do that. Um, but it, it's always a cool idea. Right. Uh, next question. Uh, when SDS going to completely replace Triangle? Uh, this is Ken, I'll, I'll answer that. Sorry, not anytime soon. I mean, the, uh, the hardware rendering paths are optimized for triangles. Uh, and while you can get SDFs to render super efficiently, you, you're doing that at the user level, uh, probably in a compute shader with WebGPU. But we absolutely encourage you to start building SDF renders with WebGPU today and tell us where you've hit performance clips. Mm -hmm. uh, traditional art pipelines still use a lot of triangles. So artists like manipulating vertices and stuff like that. Um, but the future is coming and you see like new approaches like dreams coming out all the time. Great. And then um, it looked like the, here we go. A question to both Sandra and uh, Moritz. Asset creation is a key step for all product designers approaching 3D for web and AR. Uh, we'd like to ask if uh, they can suggest some simple pipeline for moving uh, to CAD, uh, CAD Sketcher, or I guess maybe, uh, to actual website, uh, the one uh, they rely the most in their everyday work. Yeah, um, the CAD to polygon based real time, like we were just talking about with triangles, is a challenge. Uh, there are a lot of software companies working on trying to solve this. Um, I know there's one uh, DDG, they have a product called Rapid Compact, and they're a big Kronos contributor. So they're on the front edge of trying to create a pipeline solution that um, solves that. Uh, it's very automatable, some of their stuff. So um, there's one option. Some other companies that are trying to solve this is that you can start digging into for your, for your um, uh, model adaptation is uh, Simply Gone, let's see, Insta LOD. Um, there's, there's a few out there. So there isn't a straight sort of best out of the can. Like even Maya and Blender, they, they have their own tools as well that can help. So um, it really depends on what your specific models look like, how you're building them in your CAD application as to which solution works best. So sorry, not a clear cut answer yet. Um, it's a tough one to crack, but a lot of good minds are on it and hopefully we'll have uh, something soon that we can really start uh, hitting hard on the CAD to RTA conversion. Great, and then um, we have, it looks like uh, one, one more uh, question to answer from Ken. Yeah, I wanted to dive into one of the answered questions about multi-draw in Safari and iOS. I would just like to point out to everyone that multi-draw is supported in Safari 15. So please go out, install the betas, try it out, file any bugs that you see. It's passing the conformance tests. So you can get multi-draw on your iPad as soon as the, uh, the next release of iOS gets out there. And then you can get, get these uh, performance gains across all platforms. Awesome. Well, um, we are on time. So um, with that, I do want to let everyone know that again, a recording of this presentation will be available at the Kronos Events WebGL-WebGPU-Meetup site. Um, for more information on WebGL, of course, visit kronos.org forward slash WebGL. And of course, uh, email public underscore WebGL at kronos.org. Uh, again, these uh, presentations will be made available online as will the questions that um, got answered uh, in uh, the uh, question uh, in a chat. So with that, I just wanna say uh, thank you again to, of course, Ken, 
Jasper, Moritz, Sandra, Philip, and Brendan for another great uh, WebGL meetup. And with that, everyone stay safe, and we will see you next time. Thanks all.